On December 5th, 2005, I woke up in the middle of a nightmare. I was in a psychiatric hospital, lying in a bed, wearing a hospital gown, and a nurse had just walked into the room to give me meds. Only it wasn't a nightmare, it was real. The week leading up to this horrible reality, I had barely slept. My husband had been away on a business trip, and when he got home that Friday, he knew immediately that something was off with me, but he couldn't quite figure it out. So he tried to get me to calm down over the weekend, and if you've never seen anyone who's manic before, I'll paint a picture for you. I was talking really, really fast. I believed I was seeing signs from the universe, and I had an outrageous amount of energy despite having barely had any rest. So when I told him I could hear Jesus speaking to me through the TV, he knew he needed to call for help. He dialed the advice nurse from our health insurance, and she told him it sounded like I was in the middle of a psychiatric emergency, and he would need to call 911 to have me hospitalized. He did that, and he would do that three more times over the course of the next five years. After my first bout with madness, my idea of legacy changed forever. My mental illness broke through the surface of my seemingly perfect life right before I turned 27. I had been working 60-hour weeks, my husband and I were newly married and building our first home, and I was about to close out the most financially rewarding year of my career yet. Life was good. The stress level in my life was also sky high. If you would have asked me about legacy back then, I would have told you a story about how you're only as good as your last big win. I was in my fourth year as, um, at an agency in DC where I had worked my way up from rookie to the top grossing recruiter in the company, always haunted by this notion of, you're only as good as your last big placement, as they said in the staffing world. So I worked harder and harder and put more and more pressure on myself to keep my numbers climbing. My career had become my identity. No one hands you a manual for when life suddenly careens off this ideal path you've been on. Imagine your doctor telling you you have cancer or getting a call that you've lost a loved one in a tragic accident or finding yourself or a loved one in the middle of a psychiatric crisis. So we do the best with what we're facing. With my manic episodes, I had been thrust into a world I knew nothing about psychiatrist appointments, therapist appointments, diagnostic codes, medications, side effects, mood charts. It was all too much. Not one, but two hospitalizations for mania in the same month, the second admission occurring on Christmas Day, forced me to take time off work to try to figure it all out. I felt this deep sense of shame surrounding what I had been through. Whenever I thought about disclosing my illness to my bosses or my extended family or even my close friends, I felt severe anxiety and fear. I felt so isolated, like no one could ever understand what I had been through. The mania, losing touch with reality, they'd think I was crazy. That shame and embarrassment I was feeling was stigma. Stigma is being afraid to talk about your depression for fear that you'll be called weak. Stigma is saying you are at the dentist when you really had a therapy appointment. Stigma causes us to internalize our struggles because we fear that we'll be treated differently or discriminated upon or that we'll lose friends. I know that stigma well because it forced me to hide my illness for many years. In going through treatment and therapy, I hid as if I was curled up in this closet of shame I had built around myself to protect myself. I was embarrassed and ashamed that I had suffered these two manic breaks that forced me to resign from a career that I loved. I didn't know who I was anymore if I was no longer this successful recruiter. So instead of thinking too far ahead, I lived my life in moments, like the moment I realized I was experiencing suicidal thoughts for the first time, and the moment I knew I needed to tell my husband, but I was terrified, he had been through so much already. And the moment I admitted to myself, I don't want to go on like this. I am sick of being sick. I just want to get well. I was lucky enough to get well with the help and support of my husband and family and good doctors finding the right medicine. 
wasn't until after a third hospitalization for postpartum psychosis when my son was born, and a fourth time in the hospital when I was five weeks pregnant with my daughter, that I finally said to myself, I'm gonna make something good come of this someday. Cheryl Strayed, one of my favorite authors, said, you don't have a right to the cards you believe you should have been dealt. You have an obligation to play the hell out of the ones you're holding. <laughs> After five years of hiding my mental illness, I started to notice something that would change the course of my life. In trying to understand what was happening to me, I sought out other people's stories. I needed to find hope for the future, so I turned to the internet. I found bloggers sharing their stories, and their courage was contagious. They inspired me. And so in 2011, I wrote the first post on a blog that I titled, Bipolar Mom Life. <laughs> it was where I wrote about managing bipolar disorder, raising two small kids, and just life in general. It was therapeutic. It was where I wrote for a year and a half, safely and anonymously, as just bipolar mom. That is, until one day an editor from the parenting website, What to Expect, found my blog and asked me to write for them. In that moment, I was being recognized for being a mom overcoming mental illness. At that moment, I made the decision to stop hiding. I was ready to say, screw you, stigma, and put my true identity on my story. Why? Because I realized that by hiding behind an anonymous blog, I wasn't allowing myself to be completely vulnerable. I was ready to own my truth. I was ready to play my cards. I was proud of the way I was living my life despite, or shall I say, alongside mental illness. And I wanted to provide hope for others going through similar struggles. It's when we put our names and faces on our stories that we cut stigma out of the picture. If you look at any movement to end discrimination, you find courageous people telling their true stories. I felt like it was time. It was at that time when the song Brave by Sarah Bareilles hit the radio, <laughs> and I was taken by it. I gotta take a sip of water, sorry. The song became my anthem, and with my newfound courage, I tweeted to her and said, Sarah, I'm in love with your new song. This is how big my brave is. And I included a link to the first blog post I wrote opening up with my real name. She retweeted it to her 2.6 million fans at the time, and I was on cloud nine. Sure, I was nervous to be published with my real name and to reveal what it was like to live with bipolar disorder, but stigma manifests this assumption that when we reveal our mental health issues, the world's automatically gonna turn on us or push us away or not want us because we're broken but we're not broken. Stigma lies to us, and I can prove it. The outpouring of support and gratitude when my first story hit the internet with my real name was tremendously positive. Instead of feeling diminished, I felt empowered and free of the shame that had clung to me for so many years. The calls, texts, emails from friends and family who didn't know, people in my community, mainly strangers on the internet, validated my decision and helped to remove the weight of this heavy secret I have been carrying. So many people wrote to say thank you for sharing your story and being brave, and in the same breath they would turn around and tell me a story of their own struggle with mental illness or that of someone they loved. So, back to that proof about the lies stigma tells us. Because I had experienced the exact opposite of what I feared would happen, I set out to prove my theory to the world that brave doesn't erase fear. Brave multiplies brave. In the fall of 2013, several months after I first began sharing my journey publicly with Bipolar, I launched a project with a friend. Our goal was to provide a platform for individuals to share their true personal stories in front of a live audience through the creative avenues of poetry, original music, and essay. We called it This Is My Brave and launched the concept on Kickstarter. In the beginning, it was just that, a vision, an idea. Besides myself, we didn't have any of the storytellers we needed to make this show happen. I was terrified it could flop, but more so, I had faith that by providing the right environment, we would create a movement of positive, inspiring people who were just as passionate about breaking down the stigma as we were. And that's exactly what happened. 
We had a goal of raising $6,500 to fund our first show, and in 31 days, we surpassed the goal to end up with over $10,000 in donations. We put the call out for storytellers and cast the show with 14 incredible people. And on May 18th, 2014, we sold out the theater in Arlington, Virginia and received rave reviews. Now as a nonprofit organization, This Is My Brave has gone on to create unique shows in cities across the United States featuring local voices. We professionally videotape all of our shows and then add them to our YouTube channel where anyone can view the performances at no cost. In June of this year, we were featured alongside other prominent advocates in a front page Washington Post article about how more people are opening up about living with mental illness. And in August, we were featured in a four page article in O, the Oprah Magazine, in a piece entitled, The Healing in Revealing. That same story was shared online with a new title, The Powerful Way These People Are Coming Out About Mental Illness. Our shows are as much about the audience as they are about the presenters on stage. We see the same thing happen across all of our shows, and that is the connection that the audience makes with the storytellers. Our stories are so relatable. In our times of struggle, we feel isolated, like we're the only ones. But in reality, so many of us go through similar situations in life, which is why sharing our pain, our struggle, our journey to recovery is so critically important. I like to think of our stories as these little life rafts that we're building and we send them out into the ocean so that when someone's out there in their time of struggle and they feel like they're drowning, they can reach up and cling on to some hope. At the end of our first show, I was walking out into the lobby to hug my friends and family who had come from so far to support us. And this one woman waited patiently to speak with me. What she would say when she finally had a chance to introduce herself would blow me away. She said, hi, I'm Susan. I drove all the way from Philadelphia to see your show. I found your blog in my darkest moment and your writing saved my life. I was floored, but that was the proof I needed to know that what we were doing was making a difference. We hear stories like Susan's at all of our shows and through the blog post we're able to share on our website. That was when our hashtag storytelling saves lives was born. And this actually isn't Susan, this is my friend Kim from Canada, who was one of the original bloggers who inspired me to share my story. And she says, hello. <laughs> so I'd like you to take a moment and imagine with me. Imagine you're in your home, at your kitchen table, having coffee with four of your friends. Research shows that one in five individuals will deal with a diagnosable mental health condition in any given year. Think about the five of you at the kitchen table. Think about 10 of you gathered at a party. Think about 20 of you at any function. Think about all of us here today. Think about the impact of mental illness in our lives. Going around the table, if you think, maybe one has a broken arm in a cast. Another has gone through chemo recently and has lost his hair. A third sets her insulin monitor on the table and a fourth is dealing with a nasty case of the flu. And that fifth person, that fifth, fifth person at the table is struggling silently with severe depression and suicidal thoughts. Until we stop, sh stop hiding and start sharing our stories, the pain, the discrimination, the stigma will remain. Brene Brown, Dr. Brene Brown, another one of my favorite authors, tells us, Vulnerability is our most accurate measurement of courage. So thinking one last time about that table, who's there with you at the table? Is it your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors? Really see them. Now pick one person and make the commitment to call that person this week and tell them about this talk. Tell them something you feel isolated by, something you're struggling with, something you think they've never been through. Live brave. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. Then watch how that one conversation changes everything. I'd like to leave you with this. How my view of legacy has changed since first being diagnosed with mental illness 11 years ago. I no longer think of legacy as making the big bucks. These days I focus more on managing my mental health, enjoying my friends and family, and appreciating the impact of the work I'm able to do. 
I don't want to be remembered as the mom who has bipolar disorder. I want to be remembered as the woman who encouraged the world to talk openly about mental health issues. Because how incredible would it be if someday in the near future, we lived in a world where we wouldn't have to call it brave for talking openly about mental illness. We'd simply call it talking. Thank you.